And I, I want to get straight into this tonight. I feel like I got a word for you. Is that okay? Are you ready for the word? Okay, you're allowed to respond just a little. Are you ready for the word? I mean, just before I start, I, I think I saw your name was Daniel. And I just want to say that I want to take your voice home with me in my head. I want you as my Bible app. As you read the Word of God, I'm going, how good is that? I mean, seriously, let's all close our Bibles and go home. <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. Okay, amen, let's go. All right, Genesis uh, chapter 37, verse 5. And I did think it was interesting after hearing your children's director, your children's pastor share even what she said, because it lines right up with what I want to talk about tonight. And I want to speak to you about five words that literally changed a young man forever. Do you believe words could change you? And these five words in Scripture are some of my favorite words. And it actually says in Genesis chapter 37 and in verse 5, I'm reading for this translation from the King James Version. It says, and Joseph dreamed a dream. I love those five words. And Joseph dreamed a dream. I want to say to you tonight that God has a dream for your life. That God has a plan for your life. And here is Joseph, and, you know, he's, he's kind of, in one sense, he's kind of dad's favorite. I mean, it's always a mistake to have favorites. And uh, it builds some resentment with the other rest of the family and the brothers. And the Bible talks about Joseph got a coat of many colors. And, and Joseph's dream was this. Let me just paraphrase it for you. Is that okay? So this is Joseph's dream. He had this dream that one day the sun and the moon and the stars is all going to bow and worship him. And he's so excited. Matter of fact, he, he tells his brothers, he goes, hey, guys, come here. I've had this great dream. You're going to love it. I had this dream that the sun and the moon and the stars is all going to bow and worship moi. He couldn't figure out his brothers weren't anywhere near as excited as he was. But little did he know that God was birthing in him a dream. That literally one day he would be one of the most powerful leaders in all the world. That God was putting inside of him this dream that not only would he be great, but through God giving him this dream, he would literally bring sustenance, provision, and, and the ability to be blessed even in the middle of a famine for what was then the known world. You see, he thought the dream right there was all about him. Matter of fact, he had another dream. And he said, hey, brothers, come here. You know the first dream? This one's even better. I had this dream that you had your crop and you had your harvest. And I had my crop and I had my harvest. And well, yours grew up and it was good. It was healthy. But then all of a sudden, mine was so much bigger than yours. As a matter of fact, mine grew up so big and so tall and so straight and so fruitful and so luscious that your crop all began to bow down and worship my crop. <laughs> and he just couldn't figure out why they weren't all that excited for him. Now, this proves that even though, God, even though God birthed a dream in him to be what will be a great leader, he's not yet leadership material. Because you don't go around telling everybody your dream. Can you say amen? When God gives you a dream, it usually means it's a dream that is bigger than something you can achieve in your lifetime. A God-sized dream is a dream that is something you cannot achieve without God. Can you say amen? And God is putting a God-sized dream in this young man called Joseph. Matter of fact, there's a couple of things that came after Joseph that tried to steal his dream. I want to share them with you. Is that okay? A few things that I actually think tried to steal the dream that God birthed inside of him. We know already he's, that's God's plan for his life. The Bible says, and Joseph dreamed a dream. And I just told you a little bit about what the dreams were, but he's got to walk through some stuff before the dream is going to come to pass. And I want to say, if these things tried to steal the dream that was in Joseph, I want to say these things will try to steal the dream that God has for you. You see, my friend, God has a plan for your life. 
The Bible said he has made us the head and not the tail. Amen. Above only and not beneath. At the head, there's a lot of good stuff going on. At the head, there's sight, there's vision. At the head, there's hearing. At the head, there's smell. At the head, there's taste. At the head, there's speech. At the head, there's some brains. There's not a whole lot of exciting stuff happening at the tail. (laughs) And God puts a dream inside of you that you can do something great with your life. He doesn't just want you to be great for your sake. But that greatness is always about other people. And that's what God was doing to Joseph. But Joseph's going to learn a few things. Here's the first one. The first thing that I believe tried to steal Joseph's dream is people. And let me tell you, people will try to steal your dream. As a matter of fact, all you got to do is read on this story. And the very first people that tried to steal it was starting with his own father. His own father, who is a man of God, rebukes him and says, Who do you think you are that, my, that me and your brothers are going to bow and worship you? Even dad didn't recognize the God-sized dream that was in this young man. Not only that, but the Bible says one day the father said to his brother, to to Joseph, go find your brothers. Well, he's got this dream that one day the sun and the moon and the stars is going to bow and worship him. I'm going to be this powerful leader. And his dad sends him to find his brothers. And he goes off and he finds out his brothers are in a place called Dothan, which means two wells or double blessing. You're thinking Joseph's that kind of guy. He's going, are you kidding me? My dad had sent me to a double blessing. I've got a dream. I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to do something great. And now dad sends me to double blessing. But when he gets there, what he thought was going to be his blessing became his prison. You see, his brothers saw him coming. And the Bible says, they said, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's put him in the well. And the Bible says, they took a hold of Joseph. They ripped off his coat and said, where's your dream now, dreamer? And threw him into the well. It was just one young brother who said, we can't leave him there to die. So then the other brothers got together and said, well, let's sell him off to the slave trader that just happened to be walking by. And the Bible says that the brothers sold him off into slavery. Went home and told dad he died. It's a little bit hard to explain. Where is one of the kids? You know what I'm saying? Where is he? Well, he he died. All right. Well, they sold him as a slave. Let me tell you something. People will try to steal your dream. Some people are so negative. If you put them in a dark room, they develop. I mean, you can say, I believe that, and it's just like some people just love that. Just, they just see the bottom end of life. And let me tell you, people, if you let them, will try to steal the dream that God has put in you. And sometimes, sad to say, even those who are closest to you sometimes won't fully understand all that God has put inside of you. But I want to say, stay true to the dream. And of course, we know that not only, I remember when I first became a Christian, and I, I was only 17 at the time, and my mother, she knew me well. She, she was the one playing, paying all my police fines. I was in trouble with the police for speeding and a few other problems, and, uh, and I was always in trouble. Matter of fact, there were several times if my mother didn't pay the fines, I would have been in juvenile detention. And so when I became a Christian, this great man of God prophesied over me. And I answered this altar call, felt like God called to be a pastor. And I stood at the front and this prophet prophesied over me. And I'm thinking, God, you are so big and I am so small. God, I can't imagine you'd even call me. I can't imagine you could ever use me. And then he began to declare the things that God was going to do in and through my life. And then afterwards, I'm thinking, I'm standing in the presence of God, feeling this call to be a pastor. And I'm thinking, God, this is awesome. I was thinking about that scripture reading about Jacob. God, how awesome is this place? And I walked away from that altar call after he prophesied over me. And the head intercessor of the church, the head intercessor of the church, came up to me and said, I want you to know that every day I'm alive, I'm going to pray for you and your ministry. Wow. 
And then another guy came up to me, and he's a business guy. He said, Steve, I don't know what it is that God has for you, but whatever it is, if you ever have a financial need, you ring me, and I'll write the check. Wow! Come to think of it, I never have called that guy. And, you know, I remember I'm thinking, God, I mean, every time this is happening, I'm feeling smaller and smaller. And God is just, God, you are awesome. And then I walked up to my mother. She looked at me and says, don't believe a word of that. I know you. And I thought, I'm with you, mum. Now, I'm a little embarrassed to say my mother became my greatest fan after a while, but she knew me. Sometimes the people that know you right now, you're not yet the dream that God's called you to be, but come on, stay your course. Keep doing what God's called you to do. Don't let people steal your dream. Come on, somebody, turn to the person next to you and say, that was for you, that wasn't for me. Come on, turn, just say, that was, that was for you, that wasn't for me. Here's the second thing I know that will try to steal your dream. If you let it, and let me say, if people don't do it, if people don't steal your dream, let me tell you, life will try to steal your dream. Isn't that true? How many know bad things happen to good people? I'll try that again. How many know bad things happen to good people? There you go. The rest of you, show us how spiritual you are and fly around the room. (laughs) Because if you're going to live this life, you're going to do right, and sometimes you'll suffer wrong. And here is Joseph. He's got this dream that's in the inside of him. He believes God birthed it in him as to be this great leader. He's not really moving toward his dream. But you can't keep a good man down. And so here he comes up out of the well that, by the way, was dry. And I mean, what you thought was going to be the birthing of your ministry, what you thought was the start of the next season of your life, double blessing, turns out to be nightmare on Elm Street. Turns out, oh, mom, when I get married, oh, when I get married, everything's going to be wonderful. And then you found out you married Freddy Krueger. When I, if, that, if I could just get that job, if I could just be on the worship team, if I could just get close to that person. And what you thought was going to be a wonderful moment you find out isn't everything you thought it would be. And here is Joseph. Let me tell you, life will try to steal your dream. Well, bad things are happening to Joseph. He goes from being put in a, in a well that's dry and being sold off as a slave. He gets put in Potiphar's house. Well, that's a nice house to be in, but he's, he's the newest. He's the youngest slave. But let me tell you something. Life wasn't going to steal this man's dream. The Bible tells us that Joseph was so faithful and so loyal that literally he was put in charge of everything of Potiphar's house. The Bible says that he paid no attention to anything Joseph did. He put everything under the trust of Joseph. You see, you can't keep a good man down. Joseph created a demand for his leadership. You see, he acted like his dream. One day the sun and the moon and the stars is all going to, oh, God's going to put it, God's put something inside of me. I'm destined to do something for great, for greatness. So whatever's in front of me, I will be faithful. I will be loyal. So faithful, so loyal that he gets in charge of the entire house. And when you start living like that, let me tell you something. His part of his wife looks at him and she goes, I like him. I like him a lot. And the Bible tells us that part of his wife went to Joseph one day and says, come on, this dirty old woman didn't know we'd be talking about her 2,000 years later. She thinks like desperate housewives. Here it comes. It's like, it's there. And, 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 he, and he has enough integrity to realize that's not my wife because God will always test your dream. And one of the things he'll test is your morals. But Joseph had enough integrity to walk away and run away. But she screams rape. And when Potiphar gets home, she goes, Joseph tried to rape me. And Joseph gets put in prison. Life, if you let it, is going to try to steal your dream. 
Here you are doing what you felt God put a dream inside of you. Your life is not taking you towards your dream, but God is teaching Joseph something here. And Joseph gets in the prison. He's got prison bars, but those prison bars could not imprison his dream. And he thinks to himself, well, my sphere of leadership right now, let me just pace it out. One, two, three, ten. He walks it out. One, two, three. It's ten, ten foot by ten foot. Right now, God has given me control of ten foot by ten foot. That is the sphere of my influence today. So if I'm in charge of this prison cell and that's all that I have, that's all that God's given me, I'm going to have the cleanest, the tidiest prison cell there ever was. I'm going to polish the bars. I'm going to wash the floor. I'm going to wash the walls. Now, I don't know what happened, but I do know this. But the Bible says the prison warden so watched Joseph over many years that Joseph ended up being put in charge of the prison. A prisoner. In charge of the prison. He created a demand for his leadership. He acted like his dream. And I don't know how it started, but maybe the warden one day walked past and we're, oh, don't we like a dirty cell, Joseph? Well, I'm just trying to keep it clean. Well, I'll tell you what, Joseph, why don't you clean the whole wing? And Joseph thinks, awesome, the sphere of my leadership is already increasing. Come on, are you catching this? Don't let people steal your dream. Don't let life steal your dream. You be faithful what God has put in front of you. And that's whatever it is, is what God's put in front of you. You don't demand to be a leader. You create a demand for your leadership. Don't let life imprison your dreams. Come on, somebody say amen. And perhaps... The most powerful thing of all that I believe will ultimately try to steal everybody's dream is this thing called time. Everybody say time. Let me tell you something. Time is one of the greatest killers of dreams I know. That actually, I want you to think about this because Joseph was in prison for a long time. Most scholars believe it was probably somewhere between 16 to 18 years from the day that God put the dream inside of Joseph to the day that the dream came to pass. It was actually Joseph in prison, and he was actually interpreting other people's dreams that got him an audience with Pharaoh. It was Joseph. And let me tell you, sometimes you're thinking, how does my dream come to pass? By keep interpreting other people's dreams. Don't get get consumed with yourself. And here is Joseph, and he's interpreting someone else's dream. Happened to be somebody who worked for Pharaoh. And for this man, the dream worked out good. Joseph said, you're going to get out of here. You're going to be back serving with Pharaoh. So Pharaoh now has a dream. And Pharaoh can't understand the dream. And he calls for all the king's horses and all the king's men. But they couldn't put Humpty together again. They didn't know what the interpretation of the dream was. And then one of the guys says, hey, when I was in jail, you were in jail. Yeah, that's another story. When I was in jail, there was this guy that told me I'd get out. You ought to get him. I think he could interpret your dream. And that's what got Joseph in the place where he interpreted the dream. Seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. And what's going to happen, king? There's going to be seven years of prosperity, best prosperity the world's ever known. But then there's going to be seven years of famine. And the seven skinny cows are the seven, are the se- are seven years of famine. And the seven skinny cows are going to eat the seven fat cows. And the seven fat cows are going to get consumed by the seven skinny cows. But the seven skinny cows are just going to be just as skinny after having eaten the fat cows as before when they were skinny. And they never put on any weight because the famine will be so severe. So you've got to provide and put aside resources so that we will survive the famine. And you will be able to be a distribution center and help everybody get through this. Yeah. Joseph goes, Pharaoh goes, you're my man. But there was a lot of time. And time, I believe, will try to steal each and every one of our dreams. Let me show you one more verse in the Bible. Seeing how we've done Old Testament, I thought we'd better do New Testament. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah. Let's say Zechariah. He was the cause of Abia, his wife were daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. Everybody say Elizabeth. So let me shorten their name, Zach and Liz. 
Everybody with me? Now watch this now, watch this. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and all the ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. Did you hear that? The Bible says that they were both righteous before God. And God put it in his word. These are good people. They were at the prayer meeting. They were tithing. They were color coordinated. I mean, both right, not just one, both righteous before God, walking in all the ordinances of the Lord and the commandments of the Lord blamelessly. You couldn't find fault with them. And look what it says here. And they had, Elizabeth had no child because she was barren. And I love this. They were both now well stricken in years. That's a very polite way of saying you're old, isn't it? My, you're well stricken in years. And now watch this now because I've memorized these next few verses. See if you can't help, see if you can't understand what's happening here. This is a godly man. Everybody understanding this? This is actually the story of John the Baptist's father and how John the Baptist came into being. And here it is. It says here that while he executed the priest's office before God in order of the course according to the custom, it was his lot to burn incense and to go into the temple. Did you hear that? It came to pass that while he executed the priest's office in order of God, according to the custom, in order of the course, according to the custom, it was his turn to be the priestly man that go burns incense. In other words, this is what it's saying. He's been there. He's done it before. How many of you come to church and you're in church and you're clapping and you're singing, but your mind is somewhere else? Who's ever driven your car? And maybe from your house to work or from house to church. And all of a sudden you get to church and you go, did I stop at that stop sign? Who's ever done that? Okay. I mean, by the way, who's ever done that? Please stay off the road. You're very scary people. (laughs) But we can get so used to doing things that we didn't even pay attention to what we're doing. Amen. You You can be here tonight and you're here, but you're not really here because your mind is somewhere else. It came to pass, he executed the priest's office before God in order of the course, according to the custom. It was his lot to burn incense. Everybody hearing it? Okay, you're hearing me now? Okay, how many are hearing me right now? Okay, the rest of you, we know where you're not right now. (laughs) And look what the Bible says here. And then an angel, I love this, verse 11, appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said, Fear not. Anybody believe there are such a thing as angels? Okay. The angel said, fear not. I love that. Matter of fact, I remember one time when I was a youth pastor, my wife and I, we were running a youth ministry and we had a prayer meeting for all our youth group and for the city that we were in the youth pastor in. And we had about, I don't know, probably a couple of hundred young people in our youth group. And I called a prayer meeting and only 18 young people came to the prayer meeting. I was mad. I thought on a normal night, there's several hundred, and now I'm calling a prayer meeting, and only 18 young people came to the prayer meeting. These backslidden young people, I thought, they can't pray. And so I thought, well, whoever's here, we're going to pray. We started praying. I believe in angels. Because that night after we prayed, I'm telling you, the presence of God was so real. After we prayed, do you know what it's like in God where where the presence of God is, he turns up? I mean, we know God is everywhere, don't we? He is omnipresent. But do you know those times when suddenly you know He's here? Like He's everywhere, but now it's like the manifest presence of God. The hair on your head. And do you know what it's like in God where you're too scared to move because you're just too scared to move? Or do you know what it's like where you do, when you know it's God, whatever you're doing, you don't want to do anything differently. So if your eyes are closed, don't open them because you don't want that to go away. If your hand's here, don't put it there. It might change. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God, and I said, young people, God is here. He's heard our prayers. And they all went, we know. And I'm telling you, the presence of God never had it been more tangible, never had it been more powerful. And I said, the Lord has heard our prayers, and he sent angels in to answer our prayers for the young people we prayed for tonight. And then all of a sudden, this is the absolute truth. An acoustic guitar, just like this one, was on a stand, just like this one. And this is the absolute truth. My wife was there, began to play all by itself. 
an angel came into the meeting and started playing the guitar. What do you do when an angel comes into your meeting and starts playing the guitar? They never taught me that in Bible school. I'm just going, hey, 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 hey. I'm trying to think, there's got to be some logical explanation. It wasn't just like a running of the strings. It was a tune. The guitar was playing. I turned to my brother-in-law and said, what are we going to do? I don't know what to do. Some young people, we call it sucking carpet in Australia. They go straight down to the carpet and they go, oh, God. And others started jumping up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Others, oh God, I repent of this sin, this sin, this sin. <laughs> I'm going to talk to a few of them later. We need to talk, man. I heard you too. I said to my brother, look, quick, go play the guitar. Let's worship God. And I never get my brother-in-law walked over to the guitar that had stopped playing by now. And he looks up, trying to maybe imagine where this angel might be. He says, excuse me, he says, do you want to play this or should I? That was the night I realized we are a part of the church, that angels are real, that God, His presence is so powerful and so rich. And so we are a part of the church. Come on. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Here's the problem with this, brother. An angel comes. Behold, I've sent to give you good news. You will have a son. His name shall be John, John the Baptist. You will make people ready for the Messiah. Your son will. His name will be John. And look at verse 18. This man who walked in all the commandments and all the ordinance of the Lord blamelessly, who executed the priest's office before God in order of the course according to the custom, who was praying that one day he'd have a son, and the angel comes and says, God heard your prayer. And listen to what he says. How can I know this? I'm an old man. And look at my wife. She's well stricken in years. He prayed he'd have a son. Listen to it. Time stole his dream. He believed for it in his younger days. But he's a good man. He's walked in all the commandments and all the ordinance of the Lord. With churches full of people who are good people, doing what God's asked them to do, blameless. But do you still have faith? Do you still believe in God? Don't let time steal your dream. Come on, that's not, this is not just a good word for young people. This is a good word for everybody. You're never too old to see your dream come to pass. And I don't know about you, but if I'm that angel, I'd be a little ticked off. You've been waiting since Genesis. You've been waiting since Adam. And you know that the Messiah cannot come until this angel tells this man he's going to have a son. He's going, God, is it time? Is it time? And he goes, Gabriel, chill out. I just made Adam. Go play some golf. And Gabriel goes, oh. And he goes over and he comes back. Hey, God, is, is it time? Is it time? Hey, Gabe, it's Abraham. We got a little way to go. Go, go chill out somewhere. Oh, and he comes back. And, and he, hey, God, God, are we close? Are we close? Look, it's David. We got a little ways to go, okay? Gabriel, I'll call you. Oh. He's waiting because he knows this will trigger the coming of the Messiah. This will be the one that will put an end to the Old Testament, the, the shedding of blood through the sacrifice of animals. Jesus will be all sufficient, all sufficient, all sufficient, all supreme, all powerful Son of God that will take away the sons of the world. No longer will we live under the bondage of the old, but we'll go into something new. He can't wait. One day, Gabriel, Gabriel, God, now, now, Gabriel. I don't know if angels have wings, but if he did, he tucked them back. He put them into a stealth mode. He comes from the very presence of God, and he's penetrating through every celestial being and every demonic resistance. He's on his way straight to heaven, straight to earth. Do not pass hell. Do not collect $200. Go straight to earth. And he comes down. Fear not. You're going to have a son. And the guy you tell doesn't believe you. God. 
So the angel says this, and I'm closing. Singers, musicians, come on back. Praise the Lord. The, the angel didn't say that. That was me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do we have the musicians here somewhere? Where are they out back smoking a cigarette? Is that where they are? <laughs> How many think they're fantastic, by the way? Come on, give them a hand. <laughs> the angel declares, listen, I'm Gabriel. I think he did it with a bit of a New York attitude. Yo, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to give you this good news. Now, listen to what the angel said. Behold, thou shalt be dumb, as if he wasn't already, and not able to speak. Listen to what he said. Because you didn't believe my words. Time stole his dream. Time just took a hold of that dream and shrunk it to nothing. And he no longer had faith the day that God came and said, this is your day, man. I want to say to some of you here today, look at me. I know it's a scary thought, but look at me for a minute. God has a, a dream for your life. God has a plan for your life. Don't let people, don't let life, and surely don't let time steal your dream. Can anybody say amen? amen. Can you give a Lord a hand for his word? <laughs> amen. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's give God praise for his word. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for anyone here tonight. If that message spoke to you, just lift your hand. I want to pray for you. If that message spoke to you, oh, wow, look at you all. I was going to get you to come to the front. Well, why don't we all just at least stand to our feet because you all can't come to the front. The, front's not, the front is right where you're standing right now. Praise the Lord. Seriously, now, if that message spoke to you, lift your hands. Amen. Maybe tonight you don't know, yet know Jesus. Look at me. Just everybody for a moment. Sorry, just put your hand down for a minute. If you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, can I tell you, God has a plan. He has a dream for your life. I'd love to pray for you before I pray for everybody else. If tonight you say, Steve, I don't know Jesus as you speak of. Steve, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a follower of Christ. And you say, tonight, I want to give my life to him. I want to get right with him. I don't know who brought you here. I don't know how you came to be here. We had problems getting here ourselves, to tell you the truth. Our taxi driver got us lost. But I'm glad I'm here. How about you? Look at me. Look at me. What could I say to convince you that God loves you and Jesus loves you? What could I say to persuade you that you would commit your life to Jesus? I'd love to pray for you. I'm going to ask everybody just for a moment to close your eyes. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, Steve, tonight, pray for me. Steve, I want to give my life to Jesus. Would you just lift your hand right now? Lift it up nice and high. Let me see it. Hold it up high enough. God bless you. God bless you. Who else tonight? God bless you. God bless you. I see hands being raised in the balconies. I'm looking for you. God bless you. I see a hand there. I see a hand there. Anyone else tonight? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else here tonight? Come on, lift your hand. If you say, Steve, pray for me. Well, Father, I thank you for every single person that raised their hand. I pray, Jesus, tonight you would make yourself so real to them that they would know tonight that they've encountered Jesus. And everybody said, now, everybody, lift your hands. Father, I thank you for this awesome church. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing right here in Jerusalem. And, Lord, I pray for every person here tonight that their dream, God, that you would birth within them. Lord, perhaps tonight some people are going to get their dream back. And, Lord, I pray tonight, and I thank you for this amazing house. And I thank you, Father, for the dream you have for this church, for every person here in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, I'm going to hand back to Pastor Michael. God bless you, church. So good to be with you.